Respiratory volumes then can give you an indication about restrictive versus obstructive disorders. Remember that restrictive disorders were disorders where the lung is compromised at changing volumes. It can't change volume as well. We would see something that makes it hard to increase the volume of the lung as a reduction in volume. So we'd expect this to be reduced. And that's kind of what the green arrow is showing. We wouldn't be able to expect to see as much air come into the lungs because of that scar tissue or because of that mucus. Next, remember that obstructive disorders are disorders where there's something that blocks the flow of air. So we wouldn't necessarily expect the volumes to change, but we would expect the rates to change. And so it might take longer to breathe in that air. We could actually push this slope over. One of the things I'm actually trying to show here, though, is that in a lot of obstructive disorders, you get air trapping. And so the volumes actually increase. And as I said before, a lot of disorders are going to be mixed between obstructive and restrictive. A way to visualize the rates of inspiration and expiration is to construct something called flow volume loops, which I have one over here. Essentially, we start at exhalation at zero points. We breathe out to a peak, which is the peak expiratory flow rates. And this rate basically gives an indication of how functional the trachea is. If this were down here, it would tell us that there's an upper airway instruction. There's something wrong with the trachea in the large airways. By the time we get out here to the forced expiratory flow, at 75%, so after you've breathed out 75% of your air, what's the still the rate of flow out? Then this would tell us something about the small airways. And I think you can probably realize that if you take a big breath and breathe out, you're going to breathe a lot of air out in the first very little bits, and then it's going to taper off as you squeeze the air out of the small airways, so to speak. It's a little bit difficult to make the same kind of clear distinction between small airways and large airways in inflow, in breathing in, but we can get some diagnostic information. First of all, if there's an obstruction, it means that the person can probably breathe just as much air, if not more. So what here is the forced vital capacity, so that's the amount of air that someone can get into and out of their lungs. That actually might be greater in obstruction. But one of the things you'll note is there's not a high flow because you're trying to breathe through constricted bronchioles or trying to breathe past some type of obstruction. And then if this is the normal flow right here, we can see restrictive as basically the same shape, although there's going to be a lower volume. So the same shape, but we can't get the force vital capacity as high as normal. So let's just hit that point one more time. Any kind of flatness or concavity in breathing out would indicate an obstruction in either the small airways, the medium airways, the large airways, or the trachea. Also, the shape of the inflow can tell us there's an obstruction if it's shallow and long. We're essentially moving the same amount of air, but it's a very small flow or lower flow. Or in this case, our flow can be almost as great, but we can't move as much air. So we're up to 4 liters instead of 6 liters, and that would tell us we have a restrictive disorder. Okay, so now we have the air into the lungs and ventilation. We now have to get the air, or the oxygen, rather, into the blood vessels. And this is called external respiration. There's essentially three things we have to worry about. The first thing is, is how gases interact with each other, and how likely are they to go into fluid. And this is called partial pressure gradients and gas solubilities. And there's two physical laws here that describe this, Henry's law and Dalton's law. The next thing we need to talk about is matching alveolar ventilation, which is how much air is in the alveolus with pulmonary blood perfusion, which essentially is how much blood is reaching that alveolus. The third thing we need to talk about is structural characteristics of the respiratory membrane. So if this oxygen has to pass through this membrane into the blood, there may be qualities in that respiratory membrane that impair the ability of oxygen to get into the blood. Could be fluid in there, could be mucus in there, there could be less membrane in there. So we need to talk about that as well. The first thing I'm going to come back to is partial pressure gradients and gas solubilities. I'm going to talk about Henry's law first. And Henry's law basically tells us that oxygen doesn't care about any other gases that are in the air. Basically, gases interact completely independently. So the oxygen in the air right now doesn't care one whit about the nitrogen that's in the air. So if you started putting in more nitrogen into the air, it's not really going to affect your ability to breathe. If you actually did get such a concentration of nitrogen that it would affect the oxygen, then you'd have a liquid form, which would be a whole other issue. So there's plenty of room for gases to do their own thing without being interacted with by others. Now you might be asking yourself right now, now hold on, DJ, I know about carbon monoxide in the air, and that's going to make it hard to breathe, or even CO2. Now those are different because those gases, all three of those gases, will compete for hemoglobin. And so that's going to be more of an effect on transport, not on external respiration. So let's come back to Henry's Law first. And Henry's Law basically tells us that even though there's lots of nitrogen in the air around you right now, it doesn't really affect the ability of oxygen to go into your blood. And there's even less CO2. There's a second part of this equation that I've tried to formulate, and that's Dalton's Law. 
Just because there's a lot of a particular gas around you doesn't mean it's equally likely to go into a fluid. Gases do not go into fluid equally. So even though there's more nitrogen around you right now, it doesn't like to go into fluid, including blood. So you actually have less nitrogen in your blood than you have CO2. And the reason is, is because CO2, even though it's in a lower quantity around you right now, it likes to go into fluid. So if we looked at the air around you right now, there'd be more nitrogen than oxygen than CO2. And all of these are acting independently of one another. Bring in Dalton's law, nitrogen does not like to go into solution, oxygen's a little better at going into solution, and CO2 is even better. So in your blood, there's less nitrogen, more oxygen, and more CO2. And this tells us we need to have something to help transport our oxygen, and that's what we'll get to in our third step. Another thing we need to talk about, though, is matching alveolar ventilation and pulmonary blood perfusion. Simply stated, there's no use in having the oxygen there in the alveolus if there's no blood to pick it up, and there's no use in having the blood there if there's no oxygen. So the lungs must match the amount of oxygen with the amount of blood. The way it does this is that the capillaries in the lungs react in the opposite way they work elsewhere in the body. In the biceps, for example, if there's low oxygen, the capillary is going to dilate to bring in more oxygen. In the lung, if there's low oxygen, the capillary will actually constrict. This is going to slow down the flow of blood through the lung, so there's more time to pick up oxygen. So just like narrow streets slow traffic, narrow capillaries would slow down the flow, so there's more time for the blood to pick up oxygen. If there's plenty of oxygen in the capillary, it's going to dilate in order to allow that blood to move out of the lung, and kind of out, we're full of oxygen, so let's get out of here. So to wrap that up, if there's plenty of oxygen in the alveolus, the capillary will dilate to move the blood along. If there's less oxygen in the alveolus, the capillary will constrict to allow more time for the blood to be loaded with oxygen. Okay, the last thing we need to note then in external respiration is that there's a wall between the alveolus and the capillary. And there's a couple of things that can affect that wall. First of all, that wall can be coated with fluid if there's fluid in the lungs, or it can be coated with mucus if you have some sort of infection. The last thing is that there can be a loss of those walls, so there's less wall available for oxygen to reach the capillary. An example of that would be emphysema, where there's a decrease in the area available for oxygen to enter the blood. That means that some of the oxygen molecules are going to be further away from the capillaries. They'll have to move farther in order to get into the blood. An easy way to think about emphysema is tiny, tiny little alveolar bubbles have popped into larger bubbles. So you've got these larger bubbles of air, so to speak, and the oxygen in the middle of that larger bubble is going to have to go further in order to make it to the capillary. So there's less surface area, less availability of oxygen reaching the blood capillary. In each of these cases, then, whether it's fluid or mucus that's acting as a barrier for O2 leaving the alveolus and entering the blood, or there's a loss of surface area, then this is going to decrease external respiration. There'd be other examples, too, like scar tissue, or if there's cancer filling up the lungs, so that there's less area, less airspace for oxygen to reach the capillary. This would also decrease external respiration, decrease the amount of oxygen that could be loaded in the blood for step three. So let's move on then to step three, which is essentially oxygen carbon dioxide transport. And we're going to be talking about hemoglobin. We'll probably also just combine the fourth step, which is internal respiration. And that's when you get the oxygen back off the hemoglobin and into the tissue. So out of the blood and into the tissue. One of the first things I'll point out is that many of the factors that affected external respiration will also affect internal respiration. So things like Henry's Law and Dalton's Law, how much gas is there, and how likely is it to go into solution. In addition to that portion of external respiration, in addition to that part of external respiration, internal respiration is also like external respiration in terms of you want to match how much oxygen is in the blood with how much oxygen is in the tissue. So if there's low oxygen in the tissue, then the vessel will dilate to bring more blood. And if there's high oxygen in the tissue, then the vessel will constrict to send the blood elsewhere. Or even the precapillary sphincter may close so that the blood is saved and it can be transported to some other tissue that actually needs the nourishment. It's also worth noting when we commingle step three and four that most of the oxygen is transported on hemoglobin. So if we look down here, we see that about 98.5% of oxygen that's in the red blood cell is carried on hemoglobin. So this is the capillary wall, this is the red blood cell inside the capillary, and 98.5% of the oxygen is actually bound to hemoglobin. About 1.5% is actually free O2 that's in the plasma.